It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight again, Dr. Steve Blake. Dr. Blake has authored over a dozen major publications, including Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. He's now working on a book on fats and oils. He lectures nationally, explaining scientific research in understandable terms, and has taught anatomy, physiology, and exercise physiology. He was director of the Maui Holistic Health Center and has doctorate degrees in naturopathic medicine and in holistic health. Tonight, he'll discuss figuring out fats in food. Please welcome Dr. Steve Blake. Good evening. It's nice to see you all here tonight. Well, I'm here tonight because I'm seeing too many people who are dying of heart attacks and too many people are getting strokes. An alarming number of people have diabetes and arthritis is up to 60 million and counting. What's amazing about these diseases is that they're not only preventable, but they're reversible. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about one aspect of nutrition. I did have to become a vegetarian to do this talk, and I did that 38 years ago. <laughs> so I know that you all have heard these words, omega-3s, and usually when people mention omega-3s, they're talking about fish oil but I'm gonna give you a broad perspective tonight of what fats and oils are. And I encourage you to listen carefully. I, most of the talk is quite accessible. There'll be a few technical parts, and if you enjoy that, please enjoy it. And if not, just kind of watch it go by. And this will describe to you why what I'm saying, kind of the scientific basis for my recommendations for diet. So has anyone heard of blood cholesterol. Blood cholesterol. Does anyone here have nice low blood cholesterol? Few people, does anyone here have high blood cholesterol? But they aren't admitting it, okay? <laughs> A few. Yeah, serum cholesterol or blood cholesterol. Serum is the doctor word and blood is the usual word. I'm gonna to talk tonight about the relationship between cholesterol in food and cholesterol in the blood between saturated fats in the food and cholesterol in the blood, and some other ways that you can raise your blood cholesterol should you wish to die of a heart attack sooner. And of course, ways to reduce it too. Now, saturated fats, we've all heard, are not so good. But m what I'm going to look into and share with you tonight is which saturated fats are the bad ones and which saturated fats really aren't so bad. And there is a difference. They're not all the same. Uh, we've all heard of essential fatty acids, and tonight I'm going to describe for you how you can get your essential fatty acid. There's one that's hard to get and one that's easy to get. And amazingly enough, animal products are a very poor source of essential fatty acids. They have almost none. One of the main points that I find most interesting and most complicated is the role of inflammation that dietary fats and oils have with inflammation. And it seems that you can adjust the amount of inflammation in your body by adjusting your diet. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. And arthritis is such a painful, crippling disease, and 60 million Americans is a very large number. Trans fats. We've all heard about trans fats. Well, I'm going to talk about trans fats last, but they are definitely something to be avoided, as we all know, and I'll give you some more good reasons, not only on how to avoid them, but where to avoid them. Okay, well let's start off with the best fats and oils. The very best ones are found in food intact, not in a bottle. One reason is that the best fats and oils have these fragile essential fatty acids, and they are very fragile. You don't wanna expose them to oxygen or light or heat. So while they're inside the avocado shell, they're protected, or if they're inside a nut shell, they're protected. Once you start getting oils into the air and the light, they start decaying and they become less good for you and even sometimes very bad for you. So avocados and olives are a nice source of essential fatty acids and the other fatty acids. Whole nuts and seeds are an excellent source. And I'll be talking about the antioxidants that come along with these foods that protect the fats and oils in them. The very antioxidants that you won't find in animal products. 
flaxseed, perilla, and hemp. Has anyone heard of perilla seeds? Perilla seeds are very much like flax seeds. So there's now two ways you can get your alpha linolenic acid. So one way is, of course, flax seeds, another is perilla seeds, and there are several common foods that I'll be talking about with those two. Now, I often get asked about cooking with fats and oils, and first off, I want to say it's not a good idea. It's bad for the fats to cook them, no matter what they are. But if you're going to cook at a low heat, olive oil is acceptable for light sautéing, but you wouldn't want to heat it up too much. Once they start smoking, that's a very bad sign. Commercial oils, in the old days, long ago, people would make oils, if they were going to make oils at all, in small presses. These small presses, in Europe they had a great system, they had a block of wood in the kitchen and a wooden wedge. And they would put the flax seed and the wife would come by with a mallet and whack the wedge in to squish the seeds. And during the course of a day she would get just a little bit of flaxseed oil made fresh every day that she could use. Now that flaxseed oil made in that way without heat and very little exposure to oxygen or light had a lot of the antioxidants, the natural beta carotene, the vitamin E, and of course all of the other elements like iron that are common in these things. But modern processing takes out everything except the oil, creates a lot of rancidity and strips out especially the antioxidants it's uh, not a good idea because vitamin E is essential for protecting your heart and your arteries. Remember, it's only the oxidized LDL, and I will be talking about LDL today. That's low-density lipoproteins, which you could think of as the bad cholesterol, or you could think of as a delivery truck in your bloodstream for cholesterol. It takes it out, delivers it around the body. High-density lipoprotein, you might think of it more like a garbage truck that takes the cholesterol in your bloodstream and returns it to the liver for disposal. Uh, Beta-carotene also protects the fats in your body and it's removed from most commercial oils like this oil you see up here that's in a clear bottle. Lecithin's another constituent that's taken out. And we do see sometimes the difference. There are two methods now to produce oils and one is called expeller pressing and the other is called solvent extraction. Expeller pressing is, they have a huge machine, much bigger than this room. And in this machine, they process great quantities. Now, they don't add heat to the process, but during the squeezing of the oils, they get quite hot, typically two or 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So this may be called cold pressing, but it's really not cold enough. They also don't exclude light or oxygen during normal manufacturing processes, so the oils tend to be fairly rancid. In fact, I'm going to describe for you what happens to a soybean innocently growing in a field, maybe not so innocently, because that soybean is very likely to have GMO genes, and its genes have been altered so that it can take more of the herbicide Roundup. And about 80% of the soybeans in America now are GMO genes made to withstand more herbicides. Does this leave more herbicide residues? Well, this is a question, since the herbicides are used quite close to the time of harvest. So pesticide residues and GMO genes are practically guaranteed in, unless it's organic. During the process, they remove the beta carotene, vitamin E, lecithin, chlorophyll, calcium, magnesium, copper, and iron. What does this remind you of? It's very reminiscent of what happens to a nice whole grain when it's getting processed into white flour. They both become empty foods, devoid of the co-nutrients that come in nature to protect them and to enrich us. They're almost always bleached and deodorized and heated to almost 500 degrees. And this includes most cold pressed oils. During this process, they're heated up. There are all kinds of things done to them. If they are in fact solvent extracted, they're, that's done with either hexane, carbon tetrachloride, gasoline, or benzene. These all have in common that they are carcinogenic, cancer-causing chemicals. And although they do try to extract these solvents and reuse them, residues do remain. So if you wanted a nice hard fat to spread on toast, then it would be hydrogenated. And in this process, they bubble under high-pressure hydrogen through the liquid oils and they get not only a hard fat, but also these trans fats that we've heard so much about. The advantage for the oil industry is they can take a cheap liquid oil and make it hard. Well, in my exploration of how to become healthier, one thing I've looked at 
is where do you get your fats? It makes a big difference where you get your fats. If you get your fats from meat, one of the reasons, now this could be meat, chicken, fish, dairy products, or eggs, one of the big differences from, fat, from the fats that you would be getting from, say, nuts and seeds or avocados, this big difference is the vitamin E that is not contained in animal products in any appreciable quantities. So when you eat fats from animal products, you're not getting protected fats. Now, as this LDL circulates through your blood, this is a container that contains the triglycerides, which I'll describe in a minute, and cholesterol, and it needs to be protected with vitamin E. And the liver knows that, and as it packages this LDL, it puts in vitamin E. It preferentially loads alpha-tocopherol onto the LDL, so in its journey through the circulatory system, it's protected. If you're eating primarily fats from meat and you're getting very low vitamin E, then it can circulate unprotected. It is the unprotected lipoproteins that cause the damage to the arteries that lead to clogged arteries, this atherosclerosis, which causes, what, about 1.2 million heart attacks per year and 600,000 strokes. My goal is for none of you to get a heart attack or a stroke, and that's why I'm sharing this information with you tonight. Now, here's a nice chart. This comes from my Diet Doctor software, which analyzes your diet. You can see the nuts and the seeds have quite a large amount of vitamin E. Now, cashews have less than the others. That's that short bar in the nuts and seeds section. Animal products are in the center, and as you can see, their vitamin E content is quite low. And then I have vegetable oils on the right. Now, the tall bar is canola oil, which has not only a lot of vitamin E, but also a lot of alpha-linolenic acid, the essential fatty acid that's hard to get. So there are some good things about canola oil. There are some, also some interesting things that may not be so, so good about canola oil. The fact that it was mutagenically produced from rapeseed oil could mean that there are genes that might turn out to be harmful, but uh, we're not really sure yet. Another thing about meat products and getting your fats from meats as opposed to whole plant foods is that they don't contain any appreciable amount of essential fatty acids. Now, fatty acids in the body are used primarily for energy, but you do need a certain amount of essential fatty acids, and if you're not getting them, then, or if they're off balance, then this can lead to several diseases, quite a few diseases, really. Pretty interesting. Another interesting thing about meat, and I'm going to discuss arachidonic acid later. Have you, anyone heard of arachidonic acid? I've been getting some nods out there. Arachidonic acid is a 20-carbon fatty acid. It's a long-chain fatty acid, and this is produced in our human bodies as a precursor to the eicosanoids, which are prostaglandins and things that control inflammation and blood flow in our body, blood clotting, the opening and closing of the arteries, and pain. Very, very important. Now, humans don't need to eat arachidonic acid. But carnivores, like cats, and omnivores, like dogs, do need to eat arachidonic acid. It has to be in their chow. So we're different. We are designed to make our own arachidonic acid, which, when it's oxygenated products are used as tissue hormones, we can produce just the right amount in just the right location in our body, rather than taking it in. So if you eat meat, then you're going to get arachidonic acid in amounts that are larger than you need, and this will stimulate production of these tissue hormones that is undesirable. So that's something that is bad for high blood pressure, bad for heart disease, and generally not good for your health. Okay, it's time for the worst ones here. Fried foods probably won't come as any surprise to you. Once these, now most fried foods, if you look at these French fries up here, it's very likely that they're made from hydrogenated soybean oil. This is, this is very common. It's good for the restaurant industry because it lasts quite a long time bubbling in the vat at high temperatures, but it's not good for health. I'm going to have a section here at the end on trans fatty acids and talk more about those. There's a lot of free radicals and, of course, any antioxidants native to the oil. But soybeans have a nice antioxidants when they're fresh. After they've sat bubbling in a vat for a while at 400 degrees, they really don't have much in the way of antioxidants anymore. So they have the same problem that your, your animal fats have in that. So margarine and trans fats, not a real great idea. There are some margarines now that are out 
that are healthier and claim they have no trans fats. But I would encourage you to use fresh nut butters, avocado, olive spreads, and other whole foods, if at all possible, rather than margarines, which are very highly processed and not too good for you. Now, I know that a lot of people would consider milk to be a wonderful product, and we've heard all our lives how great it is, but I don't look at milk fat as a desirable thing in the diet. And one reason is the lack of essential fatty acids, another is the very low levels of vitamin E. So those are two good reasons not to eat dairy products. And it, the advertising is a bit deceptive. If you look at whole milk, which is about 3.5% fat, as advertised on the bottle, it's really the percent of calories from fats, 50%. So really, milk does have quite a bit of fat in it, and cheeses are loaded with fat. And that's a major source of fat for many Americans. At this point, I'll have to say that I don't think it's too healthy to be a vegetarian. Do I hear any gasps from the audience? If you mean by vegetarian that you're going to stop eating meat and fish and chicken and start eating a lot of eggs and dairy products, if you're switching to macaroni and cheese from a meat diet, I don't think your health is going to improve that noticeably. It might be more compassionate to some of the animals, and less compassionate to others. But I don't think it's a tremendous improvement in your health because the fats in dairy products are not very healthful, and certainly not in large amounts, and large amounts are just what most Americans eat of these. Now, you may be shocked to see salmon up on this list of bad fats. Uh, how many people here would consider that salmon would be a healthy fat food? Come on, hasn't everyone heard that salmon is good for you and has omega-3s, right? Salmon does have omega-3s, in addition to perhaps some PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, a little bit of DDT and whatever residual chemicals are floating around out there. The contamination is a big problem, not only with fatty fish, but also with dairy products. In Hawaii, I know on Maui, we had a dairy that was using the pineapple tops as their feed for the cows. And the pineapple tops are heavily sprayed with heptachlor, an organochlorine pesticide. Very persistent and very lipophilic. Lipophilic means it likes to collect in fats. They were finding high heptachlor levels in the mother's milk of mothers who drank that milk. And they did finally cut out that practice. But it's, that's another reason why animal fats are not such a good idea is because of the contamination that is inevitable higher up on the food chain. Always better to eat lower on the food chain. Salmon and other fish do not have appreciable amounts of vitamin E. There's another stroke against them. They do have some omega-3 fatty acids, but they don't have essential fatty acids. And I'm going to draw the difference between that tonight. There are also some weird synthetic fats that have pretty much everything wrong with them. Olestra and Olene are two of them. They seem to be lacking in the, uh, the vitamins, the fat-soluble vitamins, and are very synthetic. I'm including them on my worst fats and oils. Okay, now, into our brief foray into biochemistry, we'll go back and forth between fun things and a little bit technical. This I would like to introduce you all to is a triglyceride. And the top of it is a glycerol. It's kind of made in the body from blood sugar, glucose, or it can be made in plants. And then it has three legs. Now, 95% of the fat that we eat, 95% of the fat in our bodies, is in the form of triglycerides. If you have a fat cell stuffed with fat, it's stuffed with triglycerides. These triglycerides, although they look the same, are quite different because each leg of the triglyceride can have different fatty acids. They can be saturated or unsaturated. They can be monounsaturated. They can be essential fatty acids or long-chain fatty acids. So their character differs quite a bit depending on how they look. But they are the storage for fat in our bodies. So that's a triglyceride. And now that I've introduced you to a triglyceride, I want to go on and talk about the, the different fatty acids that can go on to a triglyceride. Now here I'm showing you four very common saturated fatty acids. There are many saturated fatty acids ranging from four carbons long to 24 carbons long. The thing about saturated fatty acids is they're very simple. They're all the same. The only difference is that some are longer and some are shorter. Other than that, you see they're called saturated because there's two little H's, one above and one below, every carbon. They're saturated with hydrogen. Those H's are for hydrogen and the C's are for carbon. And now starting with lauric acid, which is a 12 carbon saturated fatty acid, this one is found in coconut, makes up about half of the fat in coconut. Lauric acid, like 
palm, palmitic acid and myristic acid has been found to increase the blood cholesterol levels, the total blood cholesterol. One, excess amounts of coconuts are definitely a bad idea and will raise your blood cholesterol. But now myristic acid has 14 carbons and myristic acid is definitely something that raises your blood cholesterol if you get even a little bit of it in your diet. The thing about myristic acid versus palmitic acid is that palmitic acid is very common and there's a lot of it in almost any food that you eat, including plant foods and animal foods. So myristic acid, although it raises blood cholesterol as a saturated fatty acid, isn't as big a culprit simply because it's found in, in less quantities. Palmitic acid was named after palm oil, which contains about 45% palmitic acid. And it definitely is a problem. Too much palm oil will raise your blood cholesterol and make the ratio between LDL and HDL worse. In other words, more LDL, less HDL. Steric acid, now it's interesting. This is an 18 carbon saturated fatty acid and it hasn't been found to increase blood cholesterol at all. It seems like it would, but it doesn't seem to. So that's just one of those mysteries. Now, I put the melting temperatures in here because fats are considered to be solid at above room temperature or at room temperature, and oils are considered lipids is the general class. And the lipids that are solid at room temperature are considered fats, and the lipids that are liquid at room temperature are considered oils. You can see that the longer they get, the higher the temperature of melting is. Inside your body, that increases their stickiness and persistence as they are in your body, wherever they are in your body, in your arteries or in your fat cells, and makes them a little more difficult to burn. Now, I just am giving you some sources of palmitic acid here so that you can see the differences. We've identified palmitic as raising your LDL cholesterol and the risk of heart attacks. You can see that salmon, butter, ground beef, and eggs are all quite high in palmitic acid. And while it does occur in plant foods like coconut oil, cashews, and soybean oil, the amounts are much less. So that if you consume excessive amounts of these, yes, you'll be in trouble. But at normal amounts, they're much, much safer from a heart attack standpoint. Okay, now we've all heard about monounsaturated fats. And the fun thing about monounsaturated fats, and when you start getting places where they're not saturated, is they bend at that point. I, I, th I think that's fun. I don't know if you think it's fun, but it's, it's neat. Once they start getting more points of unsaturation, and you can see on the chart that instead of having two hydrogens, two little H's next to the C's, there's only one on two of those, and there's a double bond. So that can be called a point of unsaturation or a double bond, and I interchangeably use those two terms. They mean the same thing. At that point, the molecule will bend. When you get several of those points, the molecule will bend and twist in three dimensions and it gets really neat. Monounsaturated fat is named oleic acid and it's named after uh, olives, where it's found in, in great amounts. And the oleic acid does not seem to raise blood cholesterol. And one reason why the Mediterranean diet is, is nice. It melts at only 57 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's quite liquid in the body. And this is a, a very nice oil. One more thing that I want to mention is you've heard the terms omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 now with oleic acid. This is a count of how far they are from the omega end of the fatty acid. Chemists will either count from the omega end or, very confusingly, from the delta end, if they're talking about enzymes, to identify the fats and oils. So this is just learning about fats and oils here. This is an omega-9 because at the ninth carbon from the omega end, it has a point of unsaturation, a double bond, and it bends there. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about cholesterol. It's a very interesting subject. It's interesting because over 100 million Americans have high cholesterol, high above 200. 200 milligrams per deciliter is not just high, it's very high. And 100 million Americans is not just a lot of people, it's one third of America. And the reason why we're looking at blood cholesterol is there's a direct relationship between blood cholesterol and heart attacks and strokes. A direct correlation. The best correlation among any of the risk factors that there are. So it's undesirable to have high cholesterol. And so this section of my talk will help you to understand how to lower your cholesterol if it's high or keep it low if it's not high yet. And I don't see why anyone would want a heart attack. Now, in addition to these 100 million Americans, whose blood cholesterol, this is total cholesterol I'm talking about now, is above 200, there's also 
a lot of people whose blood cholesterol is between 150 and 200. I can't tell you how many people I say, how's your blood cholesterol? And they said, oh, my doctor said it's fine. It's 190. But that is not really fine from my viewpoint since 35% of all heart attacks occur in that range between 150 and 200. So recommended levels would be under 150. How do you achieve this? Simple, go vegan to sum it all up. I think it's very interesting that cholesterol melts at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This is higher than candle wax. This is a very, very sticky, persistent fat. And if you look at the two pictures of the arteries there, you'll see that one of them is plugged mostly with cholesterol. And this is the end stage of atherosclerosis, the clogging of the arteries that is extremely common. It starts in Americans often before the age of 10. Artery disease is very common in Americans by the age of 20. In Korea, when they started autopsying the young soldiers at age 20, they were amazed to find out that their arteries were already quite diseased. These are healthy young men that looked perfectly fit. And the odd thing is that you can see someone jogging along the trail here who makes poor food choices and looks like an Olympic athlete, and yet their arteries might look like the one that's so constricted up there. The only way to get a heart attack is for your coronary arteries to look like that constricted artery. If your coronary arteries, those are the arteries that surround the heart and supply the heart with oxygen and nutrients, if they are not constricted, if they are open like the other picture, which by the way I photoshopped from the one, making it look better, and there's a way to photoshop your own arteries simply by changing your diet. It's amazing. I've got a slide coming up that shows that. You can't really tell. So if you keep your arteries open, you can pretty much count on your risk of heart attack as being extremely low. And if you keep your arteries clogged, you can pretty much count on your risk of heart attack very high. Here's a picture of cholesterol. It looks quite a bit different than a triglyceride or a phospholipid. And also, it looks very similar to two very familiar things, testosterone, the male hormone, the male sex hormone, and cortisone, our adrenal hormone that is our stress hormone, our main stress hormone. It also, of course, looks quite a bit like vitamin D since vitamin D is made in the body from cholesterol. How do we raise our blood cholesterol? Let's say you really wanted to raise your blood cholesterol. How would you do it? Well, first of all, excess fats are really a good way to do it. And the best way to get a lot of fats in your diet is to eat a lot of meat, dairy products, fish, chicken, and eggs. So this is one way to raise your, your blood cholesterol because these foods are very fatty. In the China study, there's some interesting charts that I pulled out of the original research that show, and I've got one. It's real interesting because they map out 67 counties in China, and if you look at the ones with a lot of fat, they're the same ones with a lot of animal products. And conversely, if you look where plant food is eaten, you see that they eat much lower amounts of fat. So to reduce the fat in your diet, reduce the amount of animal products, and you will effectively reduce the fat in your diet. The thing is, people don't generally eat a huge amount of nuts and seeds and avocados, but they generally do eat a huge amount of cheese and steak, and these foods are very fatty. Another way, now, I have vegans come to me and say, I have high blood cholesterol, and I've been vegan for years. And at first, I was mystified by this. How could you possibly be vegan and have high blood cholesterol? Well, this is the junk food vegan diet as opposed to the whole food vegan diet. If you're eating a lot of white flour and sugar, what happens is this turns into blood sugar quickly in an amount too great for your blood to handle. So the body wisely creates what? Triglycerides and cholesterol out of this. So it is not a, a hard thing for your body to take these sugars and the sugars that come from white flour and other processed foods and turn them into two carbon fragments and turn that into cholesterol. This happens all the time. If your body's flooded with it, then that is one way to raise your blood cholesterol that I don't think is widely known at all. So you need to watch two things. One is your animal product intake and the other is your intake of processed foods. So here we are moving toward a whole food vegan diet. Now, stress. We've all heard that stress increases cholesterol in the blood, right? Has everyone heard this? Does anyone know why stress increases cholesterol in the blood? No one. Now, I didn't know why either. And I finally found out in a textbook that was so incredibly difficult to read. But yet, I found in there this gem 
cholesterol is made in the body, and I want to dispel the idea that it's all made in the liver. It, it's not at all. Less than half of the cholesterol in the body is made in the liver. Typically, we make about 1,000 milligrams, about one gram of cholesterol a day in our bodies. And this is to make vitamin D, testosterone, cortisone, and other things. It's made principally in the liver, but also especially the adrenal cortex above the kidney, where the stress hormones are produced. And so there's cholesterol in there. If you want to make a stress hormone, say you're on the freeway, and you need to make a stress hormone right away, then you have cholesterol stored in your adrenal cortex, and this makes the stress hormone from cholesterol. Well, the body wisely knows that if you're under a great deal of stress, that you need more raw materials for your stress hormones. And what is the raw material for stress hormones? It's cholesterol. So your liver dumps cholesterol into your bloodstream, raising your blood cholesterol when you're under stress in order to supply the adrenal cortex so it can make more cortisol. So this is why stress increases cholesterol in the blood. I finally figured it out, and I'm so glad to share it with you. There's one other thing. Now, years ago, it was common knowledge that people who ate more cholesterol in their diets had higher blood cholesterol. And so this is one of these tricky science things where we thought, okay, it's the cholesterol in animal products that creates blood cholesterol. What could be simpler and more obvious than that? Well, it turns out they're wrong. It isn't the cholesterol in animal products that raises your blood cholesterol. It does a bit, but it's of small amounts. For instance, a three ounce steak has seven grams of saturated fat, but only 0.07 grams of cholesterol. So in, the, in a steak, for instance, you're only gonna get about 1% of the fat as cholesterol that of all the saturated fats alone. So those saturated fats contribute very greatly to your manufacture of cholesterol in your body, much more so than the whole cholesterol does that you're absorbing. Now, the cholesterol that you're absorbing directly is certainly not protected by any vitamin E, which is so lacking in animal products, so it is automatically risky cholesterol that comes from animal products. But also, Americans who eat a lot of meat typically only get, say, 200 to 400, that's 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 grams of cholesterol a day from animal products, where they're eating 30 or 40 or 50 grams of saturated fats a day. So generally speaking, you're, you're fine to look at foods with higher cholesterol as raising blood cholesterol, they do. But not really because of the cholesterol in them, but because of the other nutrients, the saturated fats, certain saturated fats. And which saturated fat is the biggest culprit? It's the palmitic acid. It's keeping you on your toes here. Now, if you want to lower your blood cholesterol, let's say it's already high. Well, they tried a whole plant-based diet. Now, remember, this is whole plant foods rather than junk plant foods. And they found that the uh, average 21% drop in cholesterol. This is a huge drop. This is a drop as great as many of the statin drugs will produce, but without side effects and without having to take a drug for the rest of your life. Even with a drop to 30% fat from an average American average of 35 or 40, they still found a drop of 11%. And this would be the American Heart Association or American Diabetes Association recommends lowering your diet down to 30% of your calories as fat, which is a very minor adjustment. And the reason they don't go lower is they don't think any of us are capable of eating less fat. It's the only reason. They know it's healthier, and we do too. Now, here's a, a fantastic picture. Dr. Esselstyn is one of the major researchers in reducing the clogging of arteries through diet. And what's interesting about him, unlike Dean Ornish, who also uses exercise and meditation, Esselstyn, Dr. Esselstyn only uses diet. And the artery that you see up there that's so constricted is a before picture. And after a whole plant-based diet, you have the after picture. It looks like a very constricted artery has become completely open. Now, isn't that a good idea? Our own Dr. Terry Shintani and Dr. McDougall here on Oahu are doing great work with this, this very same concept of changing diets and changing blood cholesterol. And if you go on Dr. Sh Terry Shintani's website and look at his movie of 21 days is, is what he does, a crash course. He takes people and feeds them whole plant-based foods, takes them off coffee, cigarettes, all kinds of things. And these people get quick so fast that he has to ch alter their medication almost daily. Many of them who have been on insulin for years have to reduce their insulin and then drop it because they're 
levels of blood sugars have gone down so much just through 21 days of dietary change. It, it's really, I don't recommend you change that quickly unless you have very good medical supervision during the change. I'd prefer you made a bit of a slower adjustment to your, your body chemistry. But here's the really interesting thing. You can take a person with high blood cholesterol whose doctor is saying you're going to have to get on statins and you can alter their diet, or they can alter their own diet, I mean, and then they can go back and their doctor says your blood cholesterol is now fine. And then later on, as often happens, they can go back to eating their animal products and their doctor starts yelling at them again and then they switch back back and forth, up and down, you can adjust your blood cholesterol with your diet to wherever you want it. If you want to get it down to 80, fine, go ahead. I think it's going to take, by the way, exercise reduces total fat in the body. So if you exercise, you're definitely going to be reducing total fat and cholesterol in your bloodstream. It's highly recommended. Uh, it's not enough just to eat right. But what's also true is if you don't eat right, if you're eating the SAD diet, the standard American diet with lots of animal products and fat, you're not going to feel like exercising. You feel sluggish, tired, fat. And if you're eating a plant-based, especially a whole plant-based diet, the vitamins and minerals that help us to burn energy are found in these whole plant foods and they are not found in great abundance in the animal products. So to the extent that you get your fresh fruits and vegetables, you're going to feel peppier and more like exercising. So we'll call this a, a very fortunate spiral as opposed to the other side, the vicious spiral down. I thought I'd introduce you to some pictures of the fats in your bloodstream. It's always fun to see a face on these things. The big guys are called chylomicrons. It's a big name. And they, when you first eat a meal rich in fats, these are how your body packages them. Now they're almost entirely triglycerides because fat is generally mostly triglycerides. And these circulate in your body and deliver the triglycerides for energy, for fat storage. It's a good thing in reasonable quantities. Now the VLDL is the very low density lipoproteins and these as they circulate through the body, start losing their triglycerides and become more and more heavy in cholesterol. And then they change the name to LDL, the low density lipoproteins. The HDL, I've got a delivery truck symbolizing the LDL because they bring the, the cholesterol out to the body where now it is needed. It's needed in the skin to produce vitamin D, needed in the adrenal glands, needed in the sex glands. This is a very needed thing. Cholesterol is not a bad thing. But the balance has to be right, and you've got to keep it to a reasonable level. Okay, now we're going to talk about essential fatty acids. This is a avocado that we grew on our farm. My wife holding it up. It's a beauty. We've all heard of essential fatty acids, right? Does anyone know what they are? Which are the two essential fatty acids? Are fish oils essential fatty acids? No, they're not. There are two, and there are several names for them. Now, one of them is called alpha-linolenic acid. I'm going to call it that tonight, although there are a few other ways to describe it because that's its best name. Now, I can't just call it linolenic acid because there's another one, gamma-linolenic acid, that's different. It's an omega-6, whereas this is an omega-3. If you look at the little diagram up here, you can see that the double bond is just three carbons from the omega-N. That's what makes it an omega-3. There are three different visualizations of alpha-linolenic acid here. We have the space-filling molecule where you can see those bends, three bends. Now this one has three points of, of unsaturation, three double bonds. And this is how we rate our fatty acids. Where the first double bond occurs, three in, that's an omega-3. How many it has, three, that's also very important. Now, the more double bonds it has, the more fragile it is. This is a very fragile molecule, light, heat, they really degrade it very quickly and oxygen degrades it very quickly. So your essential fatty acids are much more fragile than your saturated fatty acids and it's good to know that. Black seeds, of course, a good source. Now I'm going to show you this little chart here and what's interesting is if a food isn't on this chart then it has one percent or less of alpha linolenic acid. This one is hard to get and it's very important for your health that you do get enough of this one. I will be talking about the ratio and you see on the column on your right, it says four to one for perilla seed and flaxseed oil. That means it has four times as much alpha linolenic acid as it does the other essential fatty acid, the linoleic acid. 
because Americans typically eat 10 or 15 times as much linoleic acid as they do alpha linolenic acid, the flaxseed tends to balance them. It balances us and it makes us have a more reasonable ratio between the two. Outside of perilla and flaxseed oil, you don't see any in here that will increase your ratio beyond what it should be. They're, they're all uh, very close and they're very few foods. Canola oil and soybean oil. Now, I found these charts for the oils, but I would much prefer that you ate the green edamame soybeans as a much better source of the fats and oils and having much more of the food value rather than, rather than the oil itself. And of course, although walnut oil is listed here, be much better to eat fresh walnuts. And fresh is very important. If they taste bitter, they're probably rancid. And this very fragile essential fatty acid needs to be protected inside the shell until you eat it, really, it would be ideal. Now, here's the other one. This is linoleic acid. If you count up, it's six carbons from the end before you get to a double bond. And you can see it has two bends in it instead of the three of the other one. And this one is pretty easy to get. Here's a chart of, uh, this chart gives you an idea of just how easy it is to get. One reason why I would suggest that you not eat a lot of the refined liquid oils and get your fats instead from whole plant foods is that these refined liquid oils are very rich in linoleic acid. And although it's an essential acid, Americans get too much of it. If you're heavy handed with the salad dressing, then it's very likely you're getting too much linoleic acid rather than too little. And too little is quite unlikely. So how much fat should you eat? I have this program called The Diet Doctor that I've been working on for many years. And this year when I upgraded it to the 2009 edition, I decided I want to add a little readout that says how much of the calories I ate were from fat. And of course, being a lean vegan type person, I had it in my mind that I was eating, oh, maybe 20 to 25% of my calories as fat. But wasn't I surprised? Consistently, I ate 35% of my calories as fat. I was shocked. I'm an average American in my fat intake. It seems that fats are what give satisfaction to a meal. They're what make foods really great. They're what make sauces flavorful and creamy. And so it seems that people tend to eat about that much fat in their diet as sort of a minimum unless they're really slimming down some. Uh, sometimes I counsel people who are raw food vegans, quite common here in Hawaii, and they have a lot of trouble getting carbohydrates. And the body doesn't mind whether it gets its energy from carbohydrates or from fats. It just needs a certain amount each day. So if you eat less carbohydrates, then typically you'll eat more fats just to get enough for the day. So their fat intake often went up to 50%, which seems quite high and could be dangerous, or is it? 15% I would say is about the minimum. If you were a recent cancer survivor, uh, especially breast cancer, and wanted to go on a diet that was 10 or 15% fat, that might not be a bad idea as a therapeutic diet for a certain period of time with a, the precaution that it was almost entirely essential fatty acids, since you're gonna need about maybe 2% of your fats as alpha linolenic acid and perhaps ideally 8% of your fats as linoleic acid, all of a sudden 10% of the calories you eat are gonna to need to come from the essential fatty acids. So cutting it below 10 starts cutting into the amount that you really do need in your body. 15% is very, very hard to do. You would have to eat whole plant foods only, no animal products, because they push you right over the top. You need to restrict your nuts and seeds. The McDougal diet is an example of one that tries to stay down around 15 and very, very difficult to keep people on that diet. Uh, it's a tough one. I think 20 to 25% would be ideal to keep your weight perfect. And that's what I thought I was getting. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting. We all have these ideas about how much protein we're getting and how much fat we're getting. And until you really run it through a dietary analysis tool, you, you really don't know. And I encourage you all to use a dietary analysis tool. And I can almost guarantee that no one in this room is getting too little protein and almost guarantee that no one in this room is getting too little fat either. Our bodies tend to take care of themselves in, in that regard. Now, this are two pictures from the China study. I want to relate total fat intake to cancer. Do these two look similar to you? Do you see any, any correlations between there? The more fat you eat, the more prone you are to cancer. One reason is that 
Excess fat comes usually from animal products, almost always. And if you, if you change this fat intake chart to an animal product chart, it looks almost exactly the same. I know no one wants to get cancer, and it certainly is uh, an epidemic in our country. And I think that by lowering our fat intake and choosing better fat sources can reduce our risk of cancer quite a bit. And it's even more important if you're a cancer survivor to reduce your fat intake and your risk of cancer. Now, how do you know how much fat you're getting? Okay, for those few of you who don't want to buy a diet doctor or use another diet program, it's really quite simple. If you're eating vegetables, whole grains, or fruits, exclusive of olives and, and avocados, you're, that there are very little fats in those foods. You don't need to worry about the fats in those foods. They're, they're very good quality fats and they're really good for you. They're loaded with the co-nutrients that you need for uh, the fats and for energy production. Animal products have a very high percentage of fat. To the extent that you change your diet from a whole plant-based diet to adding animal products, even at one meal, you will raise your fats above the level that is healthful for you. And this is why the whole food plant-based diet is more healthful because you tend not to get excessive amounts in these two. Now, nuts and seeds do have a high percentage of fats. And uh, by the way, macadamia nuts have the highest percentage of fat of any nuts that I've checked, about 84% fat. And they also have an unusual monounsaturated fat called palmitoleic acid, which instead of like oleic acid has 18 carbons and is monounsaturated, palmitoleic acid has 16 carbons and is monounsaturated. Beans are really nice sources of fats, especially green beans. And they have lovely, lovely fats. Uh, just the right amount, not too much, not too little. Plenty of alpha linolenic acid, plenty of linoleic acid, plenty of vitamin E. Really an excellent food for many reasons. I want to talk to you a little bit about phospholipids. We've been having an easy time talking about how much fat we eat. This is a picture of a membrane. Now this membrane is, could be around a cell or around the little organelles inside the cell. It's a double layer. You see the double layers there. Those double layers are made of phospholipids. In phospholipids, there's three kinds of fats in the body, basically. There's triglycerides, cholesterol, and phospholipids. So this is the third fat, and I want to introduce this to you so you have a rounded idea of what the fats are. Also, phospholipids are really, really important. Now, just like the triglycerides, they have, well, two legs instead of three. Their third leg's kind of busy holding the, see the top of this is, uh, holding a phosphate and something else. These legs can be bent, like the one on the right, or they can be straight. Now, if they're both saturated fatty acids or trans fats, they're straight, they pack together in the cell membranes, and this packing together makes it difficult for the blood sugar to exit the bloodstream and go into the cells. This, this makes diabetes more risky. Here are some of the types. You've maybe heard of phosphatidylcholine and lecithin, and I'm going to move off of this slide. Soybeans are a great source. There are many good sources. Now, for the nitty-gritty of the talk, eicosanoids. Eicosanoids, the word means 20 carbons, so okay, it's not as scary anymore. There are three kinds of eicosanoids, and there are thromboxanes, and these are made from thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are blood platelets that control clotting, and they control clotting. Then there are leukotriens, a big word, but the leuco means white, and they're made in white blood cells. And then there are prostaglandins that control many, many functions in the body, inflammation and pain, and of course blood clotting and things like that. Here's a simplified chart of how they work. If you look at the evening primrose oil or borage oil as a source of gamma linolenic acid, although it is an omega-6, it tends to reduce inflammation and clotting in the body. If you get an overabundance of most vegetable oils and your linoleic acid, this will increase your likelihood of getting a heart attack or a stroke. And so it's not a good thing to get too many of those. And this is one of my points in this lecture tonight I, I would like you to remember. The thromboxanes constrict the arteries and they increase blood clotting. This is bad for strokes and very bad for heart attacks. The prostaglandins the, of the series two, also made from omega-6s, also increase inflammation and blood clotting. The inflammation increases arthritic tendencies. And inflammatory reactions of all kinds, whether they're autoimmune reactions or, or transient reactions, are made. Now, as you see, flax seeds, as an example of alpha linolenic acid, have just the opposite effect. They reduce your tendency toward inflammation and heart disease. Now, 
This chart is a bit more difficult, and I won't keep you here long, but I wanted to show you that the two, um, two classes, the omega-3s and omega-6s, compete for this delta-60 saturase. And I want to show you that in our bodies, these are made into the long-chain fatty acids. And across this, these here, we have the three. Arachidonic acid is one of the 20 carbon fatty acids that's made into eicosanoids. Arachidonic acid is the less desirable one. It's found in meat, by the way. There are different ways to control our inflammation. One way is to interfere with this cyclooxygenase that creates these eicosanoids, and that's what NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, like Advil do. Another way to control it is to take more meat in the diet, and this increases your inflammation. Another way to lower inflammation is to take more of the alpha-linolenic acid into your body through whole foods. And this is going to decrease the inflammation and tendency toward blood clotting. Now, I won't go further into this slide. If you want to contemplate it, you can look at the video, which will be up on the website soon, and take a good hour with this one. Uh, it took me longer than that to draw it, believe me. Now, I want to mention fish oil. Fish oil is not made by fish. It's made by algae and concentrated into fish. Now, when your body has a problem, let's say this elbow has a, a damage and it needs to some inflammation, your body will locally produce the tissue hormones that create that inflammation. Perhaps they'll constrict the blood flow right here, nowhere else. And they last very short, less than five minutes, these tissue hormones. If you take EPA in the form of fish oil, your entire body will become less inflamed. Now this has a downside and your blood flow, your blood clotting will be decreased. So this increases your bleeding tendencies. In fact, even a three ounce portion of salmon can increase bleeding tendencies and would be contraindicated, for instance, before surgery. And in fact, just small amounts of fish or fish oil can lower your immune response and is certainly contraindicated for older people where immune response is especially important. So I wanted to bring that to your attention that we need to make just the right amount in our own bodies. DHA is a eicosapentaenoic acid. The eico means 20, the penta means five points of unsaturation, five double bonds. Docosahexanoic acid becomes less exotic a name when the doco means 22 and the hex means six points that it's unsaturated. These are very fragile oils. If you're buying fish oil, it's almost certain to be rancid. It really goes rancid extremely quickly. DHA is essential for humans, but we make the right amount, and it's coming into light now that there are docosinoids, very much like the eicosanoids. We know so little bit about them that I'm not going to introduce them tonight, but messing around with our DHA by taking it in exogenously from an external source is probably not a good idea. I'd rather that you made it yourself. And of course, I talked about arachidonic acid and how that increases inflammation. And again, we should make the correct amounts in the correct place in our body and not count on getting it from meat, which can alter our balance even more than it's already altered toward the omega-6s, which increase arachidonic acid production. I appreciate your holding on through this rather intellectual discussion. I have three more slides for you. I'm going to very quickly show you how your body makes from alpha-linolenic acid, the EPA. And the first step needs zinc, vitamin B6, and vitamin C. If you don't have these cofactors, it'll be more difficult. I want you to make your own in the amounts and in the places that it's needed. So be careful that you get enough nutrition. One way to test for it is visual acuity. And another way is brain function. So those are the two major ways that we test for adequate amounts of DHA. I want to mention that the second step is interesting, that if you're a smoker, this is going to limit your own body's ability to fight inflammation. It, it's going to lower your own body's ability to make these critical eicosanoids that will lower your risk of heart attack and diabetes and arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis as well. I think our time is up, and I want to thank you once again for being a great audience. <laughs>